Tosh Dilek, welcome to Tibet TV's weekly analysis. As someone put it rightly, if you don't know where you have come from, how will you appreciate where you are going? For Tibetans, Tibet's past history is the pride and the backbone of the current political movement. To unearth the historical status and the current understanding of Tibet's position in contemporary world, a renowned Tibetologist Claude Api is the man of many answers on these issues. Mr. Claude Api is a popular journalist and serving as director of Pavilion of Tibetan Culture, Oroville. Welcome to Tibet TV, sir. Thank you for inviting me. Sir, you have written four volumes on Tibet's relation with India. Tell us about each volume's gist and how China develops its Tibet playbook. My first motivation for writing these four books, I spent uh, four or five years on uh, research, uh, was that there's nothing written about the uh, relation between India and Tibet from the um, archival point of view, Indian archival point of view. Uh, when His Holiness came in 1959, he left the entire archives of Tibet in Lhasa, so we don't have the, uh, this resource. But even uh, till recently, it was very difficult to get the uh, Indian resources. So four or five years ago, I was lucky to get access to what is called the Nehru paper, which is all the notes, letters, reports written by the first prime minister of India. So these four volumes cover uh, the period between independence, 1947, and uh, 1962. I will give you a few words on each of these volumes. Now, the first volume is 1947-1951. It ends at the time of the signing the 17 points agreement between Tibet and China. Now, uh, one of the... Uh, thing I learned from the history, we also have to mention the blender. And I think Tibet committed a blender in 1947-48, when for 11 months it refused the British India, I mean, the, sorry, the independent India to refuse to um, acknowledge the treaty which had been signed, particularly in 1914 after the uh, Shimla Convention. I think Tibet should have just signed it and it would have made certainly a difference. Um, this period is marked by the um, invasion of Eastern Tibet, the fall of Chamdo. Uh, Mao Zedong was a great strategist. He saw the, the takeover of Tibet in two phases. The first was a military phase, which lasted 11, 12 days. Uh, they crossed the Upper Yangtze on 7 of October, and by 19 of uh, October 1950, Chamdo had fallen, and the uh, governor of Chamdo, Nabo Nawangjime, had surrendered. So that was the first phase, and Mao wanted the second phase to be a diplomatic phase, so it ended up with the 17 points agreement. Now, um, this phase saw so, uh, India. I would not say betraying Tibet, but just forgetting about Tibet and refusing to see that Tibet, an independent country, had been invaded by a foreign army. And that was a big blunder for India because in the process, India lost its own uh, peaceful border. So that book goes in, into all these uh, issues. But I want to mention particularly that um, we always say that uh, Jawal Nehru, the prime minister, and his uh, ambassador in Peking, K.M. Panikar, just uh, didn't support Tibet. But within his own government, there was a lot of uh, uh, politicians, as well as diplomats, who supported Tibet. And actually, um, unfortunately, Sadar Patel passed away just two months on 15 December 1950, uh, hardly two months after Tibet was invaded. But Sadar Patel had around him many Indian politicians, like uh, uh, Rajendra Prasad, the president, K.M. Munchi, uh, Rajagopal Achari, as well diplomat, senior diplomat, um, G.S. Bashpai, were understanding and could see the implication of losing uh, India's independent neighbor. So now I'll go to the second volume. Second volume, uh, to, it, it ended up by the Panchil Agreement, which in one way put the seal on the um, 
Tibet invasion by China. But one uh, event which was not recorded earlier that uh, I found many new things in this Nehru paper, as well as uh, other documents that I consulted in the National Archive of India. One is the downgrading of the um, uh, mission, Indian mission in Lhasa. Till August 1952, in India had a full-fledged mission, means India had an embassy. It means legally that uh, Tibet was conducting its own uh, foreign affairs. And one of the criteria to, which shows that you're an independent country if this country is able to conduct its own foreign affairs. So uh, KM Panikar, the ambassador in, uh, in Indian ambassador in Beijing, uh, manipulated, I would say, to close down that um, Indian mission and makes it a uh, consulate general. Consulate general means it was part of the uh, embassy in Beijing and it was no more an independent. And this was passed without informing the Indian parliament, without informing the Indian media, and very, very few people in the Ministry of External Affairs knew, but it was uh, a bad sign for the years to come. And it ended up by signing that uh, Panchil Agreement, which is a very beautiful agreement if you look at the Panchil, the five principles of non-intervention and I would say it's nearly Buddhist principles, these uh, five principles. But behind, after the principle, all the articles were the last nail in, in, in uh, Tibet's coffin. So that was a real tragedy. The third volume goes, uh, starts in uh, 1955 and um, ends up in the visit of His Holiness in 1956-57, the two months visit of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and His Holiness the Panchen Rinpoche. So this period saw a degradation of the situation. India had three Indian trade agency in Tibet, in Yatong, in Chumbi Valley, Domo, uh, one in Gyanse and one in Western Tibet, in Gartok, which was a very important one because the entire Himalayan belt, particularly in Machal Pradesh, Ladakh, and what is today Uttarakhand, were trading. The entire life of the uh, Himalaya was with, uh, in the relation with Tibet. Not only monks were going to the big monastery, there were 400 monks um, from Ladakh in Tibet, but also the, every village was in Uttarakhand today or in Himachal, Kinor, Spiti, was trading with Tibet. And that uh, Indian trade agency in Gartok was very important for that. So um, the situation was quite bad by the uh, end of 56. And um, the government of China accepted uh, that His Holiness visit and many Tibetans had hoped that something would change or that His Holiness would stay in India. But His Holiness decided that to give another chance to China. Because at the time of his visit, Chuan Lai came three times to India and somehow convinced uh, Nehru, the Indian Prime Minister, as well as His Holiness, that give, give another chance to what they call the reform. So that's the end of the third volume. The last volume is the most tragic one because it, um, the, it, during that time, the uprising uh, uh, took place in Lhasa on March 10, 1959. His Holiness had to leave. So I was happy to, uh, to find a lot of documents which had never been published before, uh, mainly about the Indian point of view on the uprising in Lhasa, a detailed report from the Indian Consul General, Major S.L. Chiber, as well as the uh, arrival of His Holiness in, um, in Tawang uh, area. He crossed the border in uh, Kenzimane Chotongmu and went to Tawang and later on to Bombela and, and Tezpur. So I got the entire set of Indian documents from this time. So I think it's uh, something quite new. And unfortunately, the book ends with the war with India, the 1962 war. The two years before the war, China was preparing for this war. And I think they wanted India to pay for having given uh, asylum to His Holiness. If you look at the place where they attack on uh, 20th of October 1962, it's uh, Chutangmu Kenzimane, 
the Taglarich, exactly the place where His Holiness had crossed on 31st March 1959. So that was from Mao Zedong uh, way to teach India, inverted comma, a lesson for having given asylum to His Holiness Dalai Lama. So that is the end of this uh, fourth volume. It ended by the closure of the in Indian Consulate General in Lhasa. That was a tragedy because now China doesn't want to reopen uh, Indian consulate, which be very, very important to uh, develop again a relation between the Tibetan people and the people of India and the government of India. So I also asked you how China developed its Tibet playbook, sir. China, had, I think, had planned everything. So they they just went by the, the, the plan of Mao Zedong. And at one point, uh, there was a revolt in Eastern Tibet in Litang in 56. And so China repressed this revolt. And uh, it was like a playbook for what happened in uh, March 59 in Lhasa. So they were very clear what they wanted. Mao Zedong wanted just to dominate Tibet. To, uh, to, to that Tibet should become again part of, they said Tibet has always been part of, of India. That's not true, but it's their interpretation. So they wanted to implement this. So from 1950, October, when they enter in Eastern Tibet in Kham, till 1959, till 1962, uh, the, um, it was absolutely clear what they wanted, and they just implemented it. Okay, so, so historically, Tibet was a buffer zone between India and China. So how has China's annexation of Tibet caused uh, instability in Asia in general, and India in particular? So, sir, can you testify some of independent Tibet's past history, sir? Tibet was independent. I mean, Tibet had its own currency, its own uh, uh, stamps, its own language, its own religion. And moreover, in uh, Tibet had its own foreign policy, at least till 52. Uh, it, it went bad, but till 54 at its own uh, foreign bureau, which was like the Ministry of External Affairs in India. So, and dealing uh, officially with India. So, uh, 54 was a turning point. The uh, Panchil Agreement, India put a stamp on the inv invasion of Tibet. Now, uh, it's a tremendous change for uh, India and a Asia. And leaders like Sadar Patel or uh, J.S. Bajpai saw what was coming up. And uh, the India basically lost a border, a peaceful border, a peaceful neighbor. When you have peaceful neighbor, your life is good. If you have a bad neighbor, aggressive neighbor, your life is bad. Whether you live in a colony or in Manjnukatila or in, or in France or anywhere in the world. So it's what happened to India. It's what some of the officers, um, Indian officers posted in Tibet. I have to mention Mr. Shumul Sina who was the head of the mission from 1950 to 52, was a remarkable diplomat and who foresaw everything what was, happen, was going to happen to India. So uh, Tibet lost its independence, but India lost a, a border, a peaceful border. There was not even police. In the first years, Nehru uh, from 1954 said we should send police uh, on the border, whether in Nifa, which is Arunachal today, or in um, Uttarakhand, which was UP at that time, or in Ladakh, in Demchok. But um, there was no need of even a police force uh, when Tibet was independent. And uh, that was lost. And, and now today we see what has happened in Ladakh, though the uh, recent confrontation in Ladakh um, is not connected directly with Tibet. It's connected more than Tingxiang because the border was Tibet was more Demchok, Lanakla, and uh, the uh, eastern part of Ladakh. The present uh, confrontation in Depsang, Galwan, uh, Hot Spring, or uh, the lake is more connected with, uh, with Xinjiang. But uh, some officers saw that was coming, but unfortunately, 
the main leaders didn't see it. And now it's a tragedy that uh, India is paying the high, high price for it. And uh, so what what can uh, it's very difficult to re to change back to return to that. OK, sir. as you said that your first volume talks about a 17 point agreement. So, sir, I'm going to ask you a question on this note. His Holiness, the 13th Dalai Lama's proclamation of independence, the forged so-called 17-point agreement and the Shimla agreement, which Chinese government didn't agree, were major agreements and that clearly prove Tibet was an independent nation. Now, my question is, how do these historical developments contradict Chinese government's narrative on Tibet, sir? There's many contradictions in China's position. Actually, they don't care much for this agreement. Um, if you look for Tibet, uh, whatever the 17 points were, they were, most of them were not respected. And first of all, as you mentioned, that uh, 17 points agreement was uh, signed under duress. And, but even I think the Tibetans sincerely by 51, 50, 50, uh, end of 51, beginning of 52, tried to implement it. But it, from the Chinese side, it, it was not implemented. So it means that uh, tre an, a treaty, an agreement, an accord signed by China has no value as far as China is concerned because they have their own objectives and uh, they are ready to break the agreement. It's what happened in 1954. Um, Jawaharlal Nehru sincerely believed that the uh, 1954 Panchil, so-called Panchil agreement, I wrote a book called Born in Sin. I think that was born in sin because on paper it was very good. It, though the Tibetans were not consulted, which was a bad thing from the part from the government of India. But on the paper, everything would, should have continued like before. But in principle, it was not uh, implemented. Now, if you look at the recent Ladakh uh, confrontation again, uh, India and China have uh, an agreement in 93 about how to deal with the, bo the border issue, how the uh, people, like for example, that the people should be unarmed and like that. They have contradicted when in Galwan on June 16, they attacked with weapons the Indian troops. In 96, there was another agreement with China. 2005, there was the guidelines how to solve the border. 2010, another agreement when uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh was the prime, prime minister. None of these agreements, they have followed it in letter and spirit. That's the main issue. And the uh, foreign minister of India, Dr. Jay Shankar, in the last few weeks, has said many times, repeated that we hope that China will follow the agreement. Because if they sign an agreement, and actually it would be the same for Tibet, if tomorrow you sign an agreement, how do you make sure that uh, China uh, implement it and, uh, and put it in practice? Because historically, they have never done so. Today, China is a very special uh, state. You know, if you deal with any other state, I would say including Taiwan, because it's not something which is Chinese. It is something which is uh, related to the Communist Party, the way the Communist Party have been functioning under Stalin or under uh, Kim in Korea or under uh, Mao Zedong or Xi Jinping in China. Uh, they don't respect agreements. So uh, that, that's a big, big problem. So I, uh, very difficult. And now today, China, uh, sorry, India has to make sure that whatever has been accepted during the ninth round of talk with the, um, the core commander in Ladakh will be implemented. Otherwise, again, they will. Uh... So now coming to US new law, Tibetan Policy and Support Act of 2020, the U.S. government took a strong stand against Chinese interference in His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama's reincarnation. And you argued that U.S. official policy on reincarnation should be reiterated by India. So the question is, what are possible challenges or consequences if India fails to do so? In the preamble of the Constitution, it's mentioned that India is a secular state. So India should not interfere in the... Uh, selection of the, of the next dilemma. But India should say 
that is holiness the Dalai Lama from the day he crossed Tawang in um, 31st March of 1959 has been a honored guest of the government of India. First in Mursori and later on in Dharamsala, the government of India has looked after Dalai Lama, including his security and his travel. So India should reiterate that it's up to the Dalai Lama to decide who will be his successor. If he wants a uh, reincarnated su successor or if he wants uh, emanation, whatever he decides, it is up to him. But whatever he decides, Go, India will stand by his decision, and he, if he decides to come back to India because the situation is not propitious in Tibet, he will be the 15th Dalai Lama will be an honored guest of the government, like the 14th have been. I don't think we need to have um, legislation like the United States. You know, the situation between United States and India is very different. India as 4,056 kilometers of border with China. And very often it has been tense. In, people died in, uh, in June of uh, this year, of, uh, sorry, of 2020. And um, India cannot uh, act always like the American do. They are the other side of the Atlantic, it's much easier. But at the same time, India can be firm on this thing that His Holiness has been the honored guest. He should, and he, he, if he comes back in India or wherever he comes back, he'll be honored guest and India will stand. Though it's not, India as a state cannot interfere. And China is a, as a state should not interfere because uh, China is a secular state also, a religious state. So China, how can a secular state interfere in uh, in such a issue of reincarnation, which is purely a spiritual and religious uh, tradition. So Dr. Lopsan Sange, president of Central Tibetan Administration has been reiterating that whatever happened to Tibet could happen to you. From this perspective, Simon Shin recently wrote a piece titled, Hong Kong's present is Tibet's past in Japan times. So the question is, how important do you think is for Indian and other countries to counter China's ambitious expansionist design by understanding the situation of Tibet? I think presently the government of India has understood the issue because they have been facing since uh, early May, they have been facing 50,000 PLA soldiers in, in, in Ladakh. Though, as I mentioned earlier, it's not really uh, Tibet area, but uh, in, uh, Indian troops are also facing uh, PLA soldiers uh, in, uh, in uh, Arunachal or as well as Sikkim. There was some incident as well as uh, Uttarakhand or even in, um, in, uh, in Himachal Pradesh. So uh, this 4,000 kilometer of border it's it's hot issue. It's not something which is just theoretical, and so uh, that way, India, the fact that Tibet is no more independence is suffering every day of the first blunder which were made in 1950, and which are very difficult to uh, uh, to undo. So, and it shows also the difficulty of negotiating with China. The American le legislation that you mentioned said that the negotiation should start again. But I have gone in, I have followed very closely what has happened in Ladakh. When I see that after nine rounds of talk, there is some disengagement and it's very well, well, it's very much welcome. But at the same time, it's only because India was absolutely firm on its border. Uh, the 50,000 uh, Indian Javan and officers against 50,000 uh, Chinese PLA, they have been facing each other during the most difficult uh, months of the, the year, minus 30, minus 40. Uh, that's not a joke. But only because this military presence was there, was a dis uh, deterrence for China to grab few more uh, hundred meters 
in Galwan or in Depsong or in uh, Hot Spring or in the lake. You know, if you look retrospectively, China, what do they want? They want a few hundred meters here and there. So they thought that the, uh, India would uh, say, OK, we'll compromise for, we will not fight, we will not stand. For the first time, India stood. Now the problem is that after the negotiation, as I mentioned earlier, will uh, China try to come through the back door like they have done in um, Doklam in, uh, at the tri-junction between Bhutan, uh, Domo and, and, and India in 2017. India stopped them in, in Doklam, but they came uh, via the Amochu. They came and they have now built a village on, uh, which is inside the Bhutanese territory. So there's a big danger that even if you sign an agreement, they, um, they will not stand by that agreement. And uh, just the last thing I want to say that uh, Tibet and India should be very proud of the role of the Vikas Regiment of the Tibetan. And uh, the officer who passed away, uh, Nima Danzing, have been honored. And uh, that was really uh, the turning point when they uh, captured these uh, ridges on the Kailash Range, south of the Pangong Lake, on 29th uh, of uh, August. And it's thanks to Tibet, thanks of the Tibetan uh, boys who did so well that China has been in difficult position and forced to negotiate. So before I wind up today's interview, sir, I would like to ask you a very important question. From your experiences in years of research on Tibet, how important do you think uh, it is for India to rec recognize Tibet's independent past? I think India cannot today recognize Tibet. It's a, a utopist uh, vision to believe that India could recognize tomorrow Tibet. But India could do much more in many different fields to support uh, the CTA, to, to help uh, promote of the Tibetan culture, to promote uh, Buddhism, especially in the uh, Himalayan area, and to coordinate much better the, uh, what is happening in Dharamsala and what is, what is happening in Delhi. Um, once again, the tragedy is India lost a border because lost uh, in a, fr a friendly na neighbor. We can hope that one, uh, in the future that China will not remain what it is today. Sometimes I'm dreaming that Taiwan should invite, inv invade, sorry, Taiwan should invade China, mainland China, should invade communism and bring uh, democracy and uh, become a normal state. So today, Tibet, the city has some office in Taiwan. You know that you can deal with uh, the Chinese people in Taiwan. You have no problem. So the same way that let uh, Taiwan invade, or at least democracy invade the mainland, and maybe uh, there'll be a solution, and uh, they will, it will, uh, for India, it, they'll, it will bring a solution to the border. Otherwise, it's extremely difficult to negotiate the border with China. China says that in 1914, uh, Mac Online we don't recognize because Tibet was not independent and we have not signed it. So unless this, it, come, it comes back to that, it's the, but it will take time, it will take time. So I'm hopeful that one day it will happen. It has to happen because and in the history of humankind, all empires have come and gone. Where is the British Empire today? No? So the same way, one time the uh, communist regime will go and something more democratic and more truthful will, will come. And I think at that time, there'll be, it will be easier to deal with, uh, uh, with the Ch Chinese people. Chinese people, there's nothing wrong with them. They're, they are good people. They are like any human being, but the regime is not good. I can tell you the regime is not good. The regime should go. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. With this, we're going to end our interview here. I would like to thank you for joining our program. Thank you so much, sir.